Hello, welcome to the Anxiety Rx podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Russ Kennedy, a medical doctor who struggled with severe anxiety for a long time. And one of the people I have on, or the only person I have on today, is Damon Schritter. He, uh, I used to to open for him when we'd go on the road uh, in comedy. And Damon's <laughs> had some experiences with psychedelics, and we were talking about it. It's like, ah, oh, I got to have you on the podcast. And you're one of my favorite people. You're one of the funniest people that I've ever known. Uh, when I used to tour with people, I there's a few people that I would watch every single time. Kevin Fox, I would watch every time. I would watch your act every time because it was just so damn funny. So I wanted to talk to you about, you know, your experiences with psychedelics and and what you think of the current state of the world. I guess uh, Trump's in there. Uh, yeah, I think the current state of the world uh, just took a turn towards uh, freedom. Okay. And I never, I never thought I'd say that. I'm a guy that's yeah. been a I've only ever voted liberal my whole life in that. So to be, right. to, to sort of go this way, well, well, you know what? He's got Elon Musk in there. And right. I, I trust that guy. Like, uh, we just, yeah. I, we watched him, that, that rocket booster that came oh, back yeah. to earth. Yeah. He parallel parked a rocket. He just parked it <laughs> and caught it. And it, like, it's, it, I, he, he parallel parked a building. Basically yeah. that was a building that he parked. And so I'm like, I, I don't want to be the guy who's like, against maybe like the greatest mind of our generation sure. like i don't want to be the guy going against einstein sure. ben franklin uh yeah whoever right yeah. and uh and so i guess we should we should probably start with this uh podcast with uh you know kenny hand me those pants oh okay you want to start with that story okay do we do can we can we say that or is that no, a different sure thing oh for sure we can so this just is to let the listeners know since you said i uh, used to open for me favorite can, road stories we're in yeah. Kelowna we're in Kelowna this is god uh, 2009 2010 and um you and I used to drink a little bit you know uh, yes and, yeah. and you're you know I'm about 180 pounds you're about what 147 yeah and uh so let's just say the uh the alcohol intake to weight comparison was, was yeah. not in your favor no so, I could I drank my weight basically back then so, yeah. <laughs> so there was we, friday night we had a show it was a good show like we always have yep. good shows together and then uh went out partying i think we went to that strip club called cheetahs or something like that we might we might have i can't yeah, remember maybe remember. after the show but we it doesn't remember. we were out yeah yep. we were out and uh had a few drinks more than a few and uh you gave yourself some form of alcohol poisoning because the next morning you were like you weren't functional I mean, you weren't going out for, you know, we were worried about you. Kenny and I were there. And uh, all day we were trying to figure out, okay, who, who can we get to, to headline tonight? You don't remember the, the significant setback, though, do you? Like, I also, yeah, you tell I, had, me. I had injured my back um, oh, that's true, yeah. golfing yeah. and it was seized up. Uh, I don't want people to think I'm soft because I injured my back golfing, but I, I got a Tiger Woods type swing. That's the okay. deal. Um, yeah. So you being a medical doctor had some medical, you had some, it was, I think you wanted me, it was like T3s or something. I thought it was going to take you like, there's some on my desk, take that. It'll help your back. Right. I grab a pill or whatever. Cause we had those sort of connecting rooms in the hotel. Right. I went back. You then said, what pill did you take? And I said, I took whatever the blue one. And you're like, that was morphine or something. It was, it was a super, it was a high density. And so I got, okay. I, and that knocked me out. That that laid me out. Oh, okay. So now the way I remember it is that I would give you the the lower version, maybe T threes earlier on in the day, and then yeah. because you weren't going to make the show, it's like okay, well, I I have to bring out the big guns, right? I, so that's when I gave you the morphine, and that was about an hour and a half before. And I think initially it just snowed you, like you just went out completely. Yeah, and then you woke up about I went I went on stage because you were supposed to headline. So I yes, was we had to, to send you over. Hour. We could get nobody to cover for me. You had to go on stage until I could maybe make it up. Well, yeah. Kenny monitored me. Yeah, so so uh, so I went on. I was prepared to do an hour if I had to, and then uh, and then the story is that uh, you said to Kenny after Ken. feeling yeah after yeah. just I, I didn't think you were going to make it. So I nobody. Was, Sweating. Nobody did. And then I yep. sat up apparently and said, Kenny, hand me those pants. <laughs> and then he walks in and I'm like, oh, thank God. Thank God. Yep. And you did a really good show. Like, yeah. And, and longer than you normally would, too, which amazed me. 
Yeah, well, um, that's what Kenny said at the beginning. I was, you know, just little, clinging to the bit. clinging to the mic and talking slowly. And yeah. then after, yeah, I, I listeners probably don't realize this, but um, when you do a stand up show, uh, I guess due to the amount of adrenaline surge mm-hmm. that goes into your body or whatever happens, you can be uh, have a death. You can have yep. a flu where you can't get out of bed. If they can get you on stage, yep. it will it will kick into your system that you feel fantastic. You can do yep. a show. Um, twenty minutes after the show, it'll it'll drain out of you. Yep. Um, but during the show, you can be absolutely fantastic. It might take you a little bit to warm up, and and I also noticed this a lot when I stopped drinking. Mm. because one of the things I had was, uh, you know, being in comedy, I wound up developing a, you know, a, a alcohol abuse. Oh yeah. They pay you problem. in beer. Like that's they, it. You I, show up to do a set and it's like, here are your beer tickets. Yeah. I didn't drink a lot when I started. Stand- I mean, I drank on weekends, like a regular person, you know, okay. like you went to school or whatever. And you had your weekend drinks with guys after work or whatever. But when I got there, they would pay you in drink tickets. You weren't really getting money. And then the other thing was that, the show would end and you'd think you're going home right? and they'd be like, Oh, what are you going to be a shoe salesman or a comedian? And then you would have to go out with these maniacs who didn't have to get up in the morning and try and keep up with them, but you wanted to fit in. So you began to drink at their level. And then eventually you would finish shows or whatever. And there would be nowhere to go. You'd be in the town or whatever. And so they would just continue to give you free drinks, free drinks, and you don't have to wake up in the next morning to be there. So uh, I won't do it. So when I stopped, I decided to stop drinking in 20, 18 2019 right in there and one of the first things i noticed when i did stand up was uh how much my hands and that shook and not from the stopping drinking that was initially the first few days but the amount of adrenaline that would i forgot how much adrenaline went in my body and because i had always had like a beer and a shot or something before a show Mm -hmm. to calm it the first month i was a little overwhelmed for the first 15 minutes on stage because there was too much juice going into my body right and i don't know if that falls into the anxiety departments or if that's just but it it, it felt uh, that's when i realized oh my god i forgot how much adrenaline yeah i used to say i don't really struggle with anxiety very much and i think that's true with a lot of people i think that they do have these symptoms of anxiety they just don't recognize them as anxiety and it's not so and you know if you just got it when you're on stage it wasn't sort of a daily kind of thing yeah That would kind of work. But one of the favorite lines you used to open up with is, uh, and and I'd like you to do it here, is about, uh, they say if you don't drink. Oh, yeah. They say if you don't drink. This is what he would say when he first first hit the stage. I'd say, everybody, you know, won the Seattle comedy competition. All these, I'd list all your accomplishments. And I'd say, David Schroeder. And you would come up. And and I would say, are you people drinking tonight? And a bunch of people would cheer whatever. And I'd say, somebody told me, if you don't drink, you'll live longer. I don't buy that. I just think it seems longer. And then they would go nuts Uh, because you're in a drinking establishment and it immediately fit you in. And I had the whole thing of being like a guy in a party at your kitchen. Yeah. Like, like that sort of hangout mode. So I drank with them and, and oddly enough, stopping drinking my comedy got way better. I realized I wasted Mm -hmm. 10 years of just thinking I was doing well. I mean, I was still doing well, but you you weren't, you you weren't, yeah, but you weren't, um, you were no longer working on your craft all the time, writing, like getting bet, like you weren't accelerating at the leaps you, you can. And that's, that's generally, mm-hmm. and, and then probably, you know, somewhere in there, there's, if you drink that much, something's, something's up besides Probably just yeah. them giving you tickets after shows. Right? right. So when you talked about, when I say I don't really have anxiety, I don't have like, I never had the daily anxiety, but I would have like, uh, especially somewhere around, I don't know, somewhere in this the, the COVID thing, not due to COVID, but somewhere mm. in there, I wound up having another kind of struggle somewhere after where my dad died, where I'd have these sort of, I don't know, I didn't believe in panic attacks. And then I right. started having these things right around 2020. I couldn't get out of Hawaii during the pandemic. Right. I remember that. And they were not going to let us on the planes. I didn't have the the paperwork for your, like we had gone to get like the test, but they were supposed to come within. 48 hours and they hadn't come. And so they, the air counter people said, no, you're not getting on the plane. Mm. My wife ran off to try and find where we get tests in the place hotel. And so I was walking by, uh, I hadn't drank in a couple of years. I was walking, it's in the States. So I was walking by somewhere and they had like, they just have bottles of booze on racks everywhere. Yeah. It's a state. So, 
I stopped it somewhere and I grabbed like, I don't know, I gave him some money and I just, I don't know, I just shot down a thing of Malibu and a vodka, whatever. I just drank a bunch of stuff instantly. I was like, what? I was overwhelmed with anxiety. <laughs> and then. Did it work? It, it, well, it calmed me down. Yeah. Like, yeah. I was like, oh my God. Okay. Then I, yeah. then I just went full Ferris Bueller. I looked in my bag yeah. and I had the uh, COVID tests or whatever um, from when I left for Hawaii that said yeah. I was negative or whatever and for right. christy so i just took those out and hope they wouldn't look at the date and right. they looked at him and said okay you're all right gave us the tickets put us on the plane and i didn't feel good until the plane took off you know like right. when you thought maybe they you're were right. just gonna drag it like I'm some nazis totally. were gonna come in and pull you off the you like yeah right. like you're making it out in a in a movie where they just get and and then i remember i forget what some song uh Oh, it's the end of the world as we know it by REM came okay. on in my headphone. And I just started crying. Like I had tears yeah. running down my face of relief that we got out of there because oh, yeah. escape Hawaii. That's a little bit of a first world problem. Yeah. Well, trying to escape uh, Hawaii. But <laughs> well, judging by how expensive it would have been to stay there, you know, I, I think it, it, there would be a lot of stress associated with that. Yeah. I remember one of the other lines that we used to use when you, you come on stage, it's like, I used to talk about being a doctor and a stand up comedian and how yes. you know, doc, being a doctor and a stand up was kind of similar in some ways and different in others. And then you would come on stage and you'd say, you know, I used to worry about leaving my job at Sport Park for yeah. this situation. And this guy left being a doctor, you know? I, so that I would say different. this guy sold his practice in to, to become oh, yeah. a comedian yeah. i was i was hesitant about quitting my job at sport mart to get into this shit <laughs> ah brings back memories yeah, yeah because you time. did when when i met you you were you had wanted to become a uh, doctor who could speak on the doctor sort of circuit and not be dull and boring apparently yeah. like it wasn't it wasn't a great speaker circuit so you thought uh hey you were already sort of a funny guy you thought if i could learn yeah. humor and speak to people i could take that and then you got what happens with a lot of us is the hook of how do i master this exactly right and yeah. then you spent some time in there and you were always sort of one foot in and out yeah you know and kevin fox would say you know you, you have better rock in your shoe like you you need them to laugh and i think that was part of the problem in a way you know starting stand-up at 42 is probably not the the best age to kind of start that stuff up so so you know i did get on the the list at at yuck yuck so phil hanley me and brad mcpeak got on this thing where every week they would give us you know 10 to 15 minutes on wednesday night which was great so it helped you build some stuff up but yeah you do get into this thing like and, and you and i've talked about this before it's like with stand up with me i never really felt that i talked about stuff that really mattered to me like i would talk about stuff that would that i thought would make people laugh and yeah. I never really got to settle into to myself. And then it did actually help me a lot in in you know doctor talk, like being able to go on stage in, in events because they're not professionals, you know. But if yeah. you train with professionals, if you train with stand up comics, your comedy is going to raise up quite a bit. So in comparison to the other doctors doing you know kind of talks on pneumonia and uh, neuroplasticity. You know, and you can be funny out there. It's you know, the, you get more popular for sure. So it did. Yeah. It served a lot of a benefit, and I remember you know having a lot of fun with with things with with the stand up in a lot of ways. Once I became more comfortable with it, uh, and I really enjoyed it. I tour. I love touring with you. I love touring with Kevin Fox. There were some people that I really really enjoyed, do, so, you know, touring with. So in the end it did really work. You got what you wanted out of the yeah. funny. Now you can go on and make Ebola hilarious, right? Like oh, yeah. You do 30 minutes on Ebola and the doctors sure. are just in stitches in the aisles. Yeah, not with COVID yet, but it's still <laughs> too soon, but still. Yeah, I mean, you know, it does, it does hone your, when you and, you, and you learn by watching other people. And that's the thing, you can watch a really good speaker and you can go, you can yeah. pick up some stuff from that. But when you see a really good comic, like who can pause and who really knows how to connect with the crowd. One of the things that I, I really didn't like about when you tell people that you're a stand-up comic is like, oh, tell me a joke. And I would say, it's not like that. Like, it, it's about building a relationship with the audience and then, you know, kind of creating and relating funny stories, which you were really good at. Like, the whole, I remember, like, I've known you since the days that used to be the $6 million man. Yes. You know, you going around the base reference, and, right? And then, and then you had to change it to the greatest American hero because, you know, the cohort yeah. started getting, uh, you know, losing the $6 million man reference. Yeah. I had to change it from a reference of a TV show that was popular in 1976 to one that wasn't that popular in 1983. 
Right. Yeah, for sure. It wasn't much of a, but it, 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 you know, and then you also, stand up is a whole different thing. The whole mm-hmm. deal for people listening or whatever there is to make it look like you are coming up with it off the top of your head when it's actually, sometimes you are, but for the most part, it's something that you've crafted for a long time. Hence mm-hmm. why it's called a stand up routine. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, and you, you were great at, you know, being that kind of funny guy in the corner of the kitchen in a party. Like that's, that was kind of your persona on stage and it was, that was very all- likable for sure. Yeah. That's also what I was good at being funny as a kid or whatever. Like, mm-hmm. it, like I was always just sort of funny. And, and yeah, I could pull that off and and it's, and it's timing. It's what you said about learning when to pause and just let people laugh. Like it's, mm-hmm. it's a, uh, it, the difference is when you and I talk and you tell someone a joke, you don't have you. We know the same people we're talking about or what's connected. You can use a background. And then at the end, you can just be like, ah, then we all laughed and went home. Whereas yeah. when you're in front of a crowd, you have to tie it up in a bow. They don't know who it is. So the real trick was took me a couple of lear- years to learn how to be a guy in a kitchen party when nobody knows any of the people that you're talking about. Mm-hmm right you had to change yeah. like you're not you're not hanging out with all your friends you're talking to 250 strangers all at once yeah yeah and you change the subject a little bit you went through a pretty major health issue in the last year or so yes yeah that was uh april 2023 yeah yeah i um i don't have a spleen for anybody yeah. listening, I ruptured my spleen when I was 20, surfing on acid in Tofino. Mm-hmm. And like uh, cool. yes, well, I also had never taken acid and I never had, uh, I, I got, um, uh, what's the thing you get from kissing too many girls? The uh, mono. Oh, I got mono. mono. Yeah. Okay. Some girl gave me mono. I was like 20. Yeah. So your spleen, uh, you know, this is enlarges. a doctor, yeah. enlarges or whatever. Yeah. And they told me. Hey, you are very sick. You can't go to, uh, but I'm 20. I wasn't going to miss the big yeah. surf trip. Some guy said, Hey, would you like some acid? I'm like, I don't do acid. He's like, you smoke pot. I said, yes. He's like, it's like that for six hours. I said, fantastic. And I took it and it was not like that for six hours. It was fairly <laughs> intense, but the, but the part, I guess I, once I got through the heavy part of it, I guess I was surfing for so long um, that I didn't realize I was crashing into the waves. And then Luckily, it rained, and we packed up and went back that night because I was bleeding internally and wouldn't have known that. Right. I would yeah. have just died in a tent. I was showering right. up, and my mom found me like passed out, and they got me to the hospital. So, not having a spleen last year, I got a. It started out as a as like a sinus infection in Alberta, and it spread to my ear, ruptured my eardrum. I took antibiotics, and I had a bad reaction to it. I got these white dots. They stopped it. They didn't really know what was going on. It felt for a couple of months like I had mono. They were doing blood work mm-hmm. and all this stuff, and then. In April, I again, for whatever reason, I guess having some, something come off this tour, talking with somebody who died, I, st- I picked up a drink and started having some drinks while I had this going on. And the two of those things together caused a deadly combination where um, I was puffed up. I was t- so I, all my uh, internal organs were. Uh, inflamed, inflamed I guess yeah. they were inflamed and with the alcohol in my system it caused me to get pancreatitis along with it which deal. was uh, and with the infection and that it was actually they didn't think I was going to make it they were mm-hmm. like I remember yes a doctor said to me you know he said to myself and my wife like you have a very hard and painful recovery in front of you and my wife said he will recover right and he said we always have to say yes to maintain hope Mm-hmm. And then uh, an administrator came over and lines, yeah. yeah, my wife was crying. I calmed her down. It's happy. The spleen thing. Then yeah. a, an administrator came over and said, do we have all your affairs in order? Like it was very, they oh, didn't. Yeah. And I also didn't know that they were talking to my wife, Paul Meyer, some other people and like, look, maybe we can do something. Oh, I was pain because I guess my pancreas was the enzymes were eating itself inside yeah. or something. So is a big deal. Yeah. So that with the inflamed stuff. So, you know, everything was inflamed. My liver, like all my organs were inflamed and they didn't really know what it was. And they were just throwing all the antibiotics at it. So that changed my life as well. The the spleen when I was 20 didn't change my life so much because I was 20 and the recovery. Well, actually, the spleen caused me to become a stand up comedian because I was recovering for a few months watching stand up. And I thought that's the first time I thought, oh, maybe I can do that. 
I took another five, six years before I really right. set out to do for it. Sure. But that's where the seed got in my head because I mm -hmm. had like to sit around for months and Seinfeld came out. So that sort of put me on this path. And then this one, um, after this one, I decided, oh, I should probably, you know, I always wanted to make a movie. So I went out and did that. So mm -hmm. I kind of, um, when I have, a, when I almost die, I just, yeah. I tend to say a change direction. People say that you have like epiphanies or whatever. Mine are a little different of like, oh, well, I'm just going to do what I want. And I don't know how long that lasts for, by the way. Who knows? You know? Yeah. So, so, um, you just finished doing a movie. Like just going back for a second, like, did you have a lot of anxiety? Like when they would say, I would think when someone says, you know, get your affairs in order, that would create a lot of, you know, in my community, yeah. a lot of anxiety. Like, what did you feel like? Um, to tell you the truth, I felt relief because they didn't say you are riddled with cancer and have mm -hmm. 24 hours left to live. Sure. It's a terminal. I didn't get that. Like I was shocked. Right. But because I knew something was up so badly, like I'd been in the hospital for a couple of days. And I remember waking up and looking at like, as I was waking up thinking I got to get to a hospital and I opened my eyes and I was in a hospital. And that's when I knew I was in real big trouble. Um, so I had this little, you know, I was concerned. I was also like, am I condemned? To die? Like I didn't, I wasn't sure what was going to go on, but I didn't hear what I didn't hear was you were going to die for sure. Right. Uh, it didn't sound good. and so. I, I was, I, man, I was Jim Carrey and dumb and dumber. I was like, so you're saying there's a chance. Like I had the opposite reaction of what you should right. have, which yeah. was that, Hey, I am not officially like, I have not been given. It doesn't look good, but they right. didn't tell me it's over. Right. Yeah. And so I anxiety. Yeah. I mean, I was worried, but I just started to do the stuff that you had. Like, I just was like, okay. Let's yeah. do like just, yeah. and then they gave me a lot of drugs as well. Oh, for sure, yeah, right? For sure, kind of reminded me that that bit that you do about hey, I gotta get to work, right? Oh I yeah, the the, the weed show. one when I worked yeah. at the at the Super sport art. part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it was it was a very I kind of I guess because I had also had, you know, my life saved with my spleen. Right. So I'd been in a life and death thing where a hospital saved me before as well, right? right? So you have right. a little bit of a background of like, oh, interesting. You know, yeah. I was saved once before. So it, like it was really I think it was harder on my wife, my friends, my family. I felt really awful that my mom was there. You shouldn't have to see right. your son almost die twice. Like that's yeah. really hard for you know, your mother to oh, be there sure. like hearing like your son's not probably going to make it again. Right. Right. Like you don't yeah. need to hear that that many. You're not you shouldn't hear that once, let alone twice. Yeah. yeah I wanted to talk to you a bit about the um, sort of the ayahuasca experience you went on to, because a lot of my people ask me, you know, should I do psilocybin? Should I do ayahuasca to, you know, help with my anxiety? And I just thought, you know, you've been through it. I mean, I've been through ayahuasca, too. It was a horrendous experience for me. But for you, it, it created a bit of benefit for you. Yeah. And um it's odd because you and I had a, had met Victoria about a week ago and just sort of touched on this topic. And you said, could you come on? And I hadn't really talked about ayahuasca in a while. Mm. And yet last night, a person that I know that sort of heard my one man show on it had just got back from doing yeah. ayahuasca. And then another person was there. And so I had this giant conversation about it last night. Like, it seems like as soon as I started talking about it yeah. again, it shows up. Like, this is the way the ayahuasca shows up. So for me, I mean, yeah, it had a big, it did have a big change because I, before I went and did ayahuasca, I was a guy like we were talking about that drank a lot. I was out rabble rousing and, you know, I was, uh, you know, writing a, I don't know, I was writing a movie about a talking monkey and a dog and all this sort of stuff. Like it was just one of those guys. And, you know, when I came back from doing ayahuasca, I had to like, meditate do yoga i know this and I, I remember being like i'm that guy like i didn't ever want to Did be you have to you said like i had to like what I, what was in you that sort of pushed you in that direction um two think well what happened is it so what people think is i i think a lot of people think you go down you do ayahuasca you get some visions you tell it like hey i want to cure this and that and you come out like like you're done like you like, like you here talk about this 
Yeah. So some uh, people, there's this, you know, rumor out there that it's like, oh, people come back. It's like, I got 10 years of therapy all in one right. session. Right. And, and you do face a lot of things. Like you, you, you do go in and you will face your worst fears. Um, but then you were also shown, uh, and, and the, the feeling of the most love you'll ever feel like almost like, I guess what the, what the love of God would feel like is, is yeah. it's over what it's, it's beyond anything that you can feel that we feel like it, whatever. Um, so one of the things was that it's sort of, it shows it, it's weird the way that you're told things, you know, you're showing images. Some people hear stuff. Some people are voice. Some of it's just a feeling, but one of the things was um that you need to start to pray that mm -hmm. was odd i'd never prayed before but okay. it sort of made me go over and kneel uh like before god i felt like kneeling before god and uh, apparently i was you know and then uh, being, it felt like i had gone up uh there was sort of this experience of flying into this golden sort of light uh and i guess at that point the shaman showed up and i said i'm awake like it felt like i i was told like it felt like I kind of rose back from the dead. Like you, you, you have these sort so one was pray. The other was meditate. You just sort of go into this, you learn to meditate a little every day and sort of have a mantra. And then mm -hmm. I started to do that, but that then led me to, I wound up meditating with Buddhists out in Richmond, which I never thought I'd do either. Like I now I like, because I started meditating, I met someone else who was meditating and said, come to this thing. And so I went much deeper into it and yoga Oddly enough, with the shaman was we did it, we did the ayahuasca like three sessions, like I say, it's a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and in between we did yoga and before. And I remember going down before and not being afraid about the ayahuasca. Some people were freaked out. I had done a lot of LSD and stuff. I thought I can handle my drugs. Right. I was terrified about the yoga. And so I started to do this yoga and I wasn't really enjoying it. And then after the ayahuasca thing, I remember being like, we were done. There was no more sessions. We had done the last ayahuasca. And I was walking with another friend, Kenny, a friend of ours, through mm -hmm. Mexico. We were in this, this uh, uh, I can't remember, the uh, San Miguel. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This sort of like, it's like a fountain of youth place for people 40 and over. And anyway, I was like saying to Kenny, I'm like, man, I could really use a yoga. Like, I feel like yoga right now. And we yeah. came around a corner into this giant courtyard and there was a woman instructing a giant yoga class saw me and said there's a mat for you right up front <laughs> and that's what began to happen as soon as i was done ayahuasca i was given a lot of uh whatever you were thinking seemed to appear um i had that sort of thing last for probably a year or two afterwards where i felt really connected and my thoughts and things would come to reality but like it also yeah, took I, away a lot of your impulse to drink alcohol too right? what was that it also took away a lot of the yeah. impulse to drink alcohol um i came back with n no impulse to drink alcohol i actually mm -hmm. didn't want to really drink any my wife drinks a lot <laughs> okay. um and and it was troubling her you know, she was sort of a little upset that i came back a better version of myself in a way and I, that was causing some I have you on here because you're just so funny like you're just naturally funny it was like, it was it, it was like hey what's going on yeah it was it was causing some friction I had become this uh oh you think you're so much better than me now because you've gone you think you're spiritual I'm yeah. spiritual like, so finally after a couple of months of being back and not really wanting to drink I picked up a glass of wine with her just to sort of like in a at a keg and had a couple of sips I didn't really like but by making myself try it over and over, eventually you could go back down that road again. Yeah. Whereas the other person who went with me, Kenny has not drank in 10 years and he had no intention. Didn't want to go in with that. Had no, like was, didn't think he had a problem with alcohol. He just, when it was out, he just never felt like drinking again. And I can't really explain what everybody's experience and what they yeah. get is, is different. It's not universal for everyone. Yeah. Put it that way. And it's the same Kenny who you handed the pants to. You yes, know. that was a heavy drinker with us out in the same sort Absolutely. of thing. And and oh, sure. and it you do go in with a set of intentions. Like the the um the shaman will say, like you'll spend a day like write what your intentions are that you want to maybe get out of this. I guess it would be like the secret or one of those like sort of sure. like, okay, this is what you want to work on. And I had a lot of like 
oh, let me be better at uh, making money, have uh, following through with successful script ideas, like a lot of things that I thought would work well in uh, whatever the world that we try to strive through the the rat race. And I don't and I don't think Kenny, I don't know what Kenny has to work on, but he one of them wasn't help me quit drinking was not no. on his list. And that was just a byproduct. Yeah. Although he, you know, on night one, he really went to the dark side quickly yeah. and had a horrific experience. Whereas I was lying thinking I was feeling more love than ever. And I looked over at this guy and I swear right. a beam right. of light was going oh. into his head and he was like, rah, 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 rah. Yeah. he looked like a possessed guy. And then he was just puking for hours Yeah, and came out with his hair. Totally. You know when a guy gets electrocuted, his hair looked like that. Like he had the hair everywhere, like <laughs> struck yeah. by lightning. Yeah. And he came out and he he looked awful. And he just said, "I've just been talking Chinese for the last thirty minutes." Yeah. <laughs> so whether he was talking to someone or not, like that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, you know, if we look at the the neuroscience between psychedelics, it paralyzes the the part of our brain called the default mode network. The default mode network is kind of like the daydreaming state of your brain, like what your brain does when it's not really focused on a task of any particular kind. And the default mode network also thought to be involved in your feeling of self as opposed to other or things and, and the conscious versus the unconscious. So what the psychedelics do is they paralyze the default mode network. So the, the border between the conscious and the unconscious is gone. So yeah. everything that's unconscious, you will it comes into your react and also self and other. So this is why people say, Oh, I felt one with the trees. I felt one with, you know, everything because it's really interesting to see how that happens and how it in some people really forms quite a reset for them. For me, it didn't really do that for me. It was just, it was just horrendous both nights. Like I just, just had a hor horrible time both nights. Second night was a little easier than the first, but, but I didn't really get that uh, sort of uh, any sort of therapeutic advantage. I think it helped me understand my brain a little better, but it didn't really give me any sort of feeling of better. Was that part of um, like, you know, you being a, a doctor and that, and the way that your, like your thought process comes, you probably work with a different part of the brain than, you know, maybe another car, like, uh, because one of the things that the shaman and that, that we talked about was that, you know, some people take ayahuasca and it has almost, it'll have yeah. no effect on them. Right. And they have, she's had people that are mad, want mm -hmm. their money back. Yeah. This is a ripoff. And so it's one of those strange things where like, man, if you take LSD, it's going to work. It's like, gonna you, work. like it's, exactly. you're going to have it. Like, yeah. so what is this ayahuasca stuff that like, some people take yeah. it and have a, a huge experience. Some people take it and have mm -hmm. nothing. And I, it, that's, that's the strange thing. Like I had done, you know, I had said I had done some LSD and there, you talked about like, I'm guessing that's the same thing. It's a psychedelic. It's going to mm -hmm. suspend Doesn't some of those things. Yep. But that felt like, that was like a peek behind the curtain where you're like, oh, I'm connected to things and you can feel yep. that there's something bigger out there. But the ayahuasca was like, oh, well, open the curtain and come on in and sit down for a while. Like it yeah. was, it's, and I don't know, what, like, is it, a, I don't have any explanation why one is, is bigger than the other. Yeah. I but mean, it they be, were different yeah. in the same realm, but very, very different. The fact that you had LSD a, a, a few times before that may have kind of prepared you for the fact that, okay, this is going to, you know, dissolve your, your sense of self in a lot of ways. And I think that's what happens with a lot of, uh, anx anxious people is they thrive on control, right? If you if you have a significant anxiety issue, you don't like uncertainty at all, and you thrive on control. And basically, when you take ayahuasca, you have no control. I remember not, just yeah. being on it and just fall. I had this thing about I felt like I was falling, and then I couldn't. I was wondering what well, what is falling, and then it's like I would just keep falling. And what is falling? I don't understand what falling is. And I would fall, and I would fall, and I don't understand what falling is. But it would just keep in this loop. And I couldn't seem to get out of it. And it just, I just, just kept falling and falling and falling. And it was, it was terrifying. Which is a common sort of experience is that the uh, time falling, like all of that is gone. It's like you're yeah. in a loop that you feel like you may not 
get out of ever get out of yeah and your loss of time even though in reality i don't know it's it's somewhere between four to six hours yep. is what but that amount of time while you're in it feels eternal almost yeah. like it feels no, exactly. like you you really are not it sort of will tell you like there is no time and space like the elute whatever our illusion of time is that they that yep. they talk about you kind of experience oh I guess time is an illusion because yeah. it just sort of stops. And I, and I, and, and these are all things that are really hard to explain to people because totally. you're trying to explain something that's basically inexplicable. Like it's a very hard, totally. hard thing to sum up. And you, you know, you have some experiences of weird, like an, an entity thing where like, when I said I was the first night when I was, uh, things went very bad. Like they start out very good, but then I had a purge and everyone's going to purge because you faced your fears. And one of the things are that you're like, oh, uh, like it starts to show you things, the image. And you're like, I didn't know I had a problem with my brother. And then and he's gone out of your life. Like the the purging is actually you getting rid (laughs) of problems, right? Like like that's why you you throw up and you're like, whoa, that's he's sort of out of your system. And it's almost like. You either have horrific guilt because you caused some harm to these people or they caused harm to you or right. things, things. So you kind of get over it. And, and lots of them you don't want to get over. You're like, no, I'm not doing that. And it'll tell you, like, this is Hold what we want you to do with your life. You're like, you know what? Screw you. And then it's yeah. then it'll make you throw up. Yeah. And then it, it'll go in an internal time loop that you don't know how much time has gone by. And then it'll come back to you like, hey. Remember when we told you to do this? And you're like, I'm not doing it. Like, oh, yeah? Well, why don't you throw up for a while again and think about it? <laughs> until I'll you, come back until, like your dad. I'll come back in half an yeah, hour. Yeah. yeah. It, it goes until it breaks you. And yeah. one of the weird things was that on the first night when I kind of got broken, I was exhausted and done. Mm. I had this image of a, it was, it was a man in, in armor, like a, almost looked like a Roman legionnaire on a horse mm-hmm. came up by and I was sort of in a field with some other, and he was sort of over and I couldn't really see who else was there, but he was there and he was quite angry that he had to come down here. And he's like, what this, he's like, this guy is done. He had enough, leave him alone, whatever. And he was quite bothered. I felt like yeah. he was bothered that he had to come and address this problem. Mm-hmm. And that was that was the end of the image for him. And not long after that, it ended. And then we did, I don't know, a day of yoga. And we went out to yeah. met wild horses or whatever. And then we did another night. And on the following night, when things turned for me and I said I sort of was awake or whatever, this guy showed up again and was like, hey, you're one of us now. You're in the army. Sort of threw me on the back of like a Pegasus type horse okay. that flew up yeah, and yeah. sort of looked like golden pyramids. And you flew up and... Like you were brought into like, I don't know, like God's army or whatever we'll call it. Some sort okay. of thing like that. Like you're, you're sort of like, uh, you're a Jedi now. You're some, yeah. some sort of, the crazy thing was uh, in that in-between thing, I had seen this light up on a hill in Mexico. I'm like, something's telling me to go up there, the, the, you know, talking to the shaman. Like, so we went up there after that second day. And as we got to this place, there was a uh, picture painting statue thing of this guy. I'm like, hey that's the guy from the image and she's right. like what i'm like yeah that, she's like no you've seen this guy i'm like i have no idea who this is right. i like and it turns out it was uh san miguel who's saint michael uh who's the actual angel who slays demons and is the leader of god's army but i had never now whether i'd seen that as a kid i'm not religious i never went in churches i've only yeah. been in churches for weddings right. like so i had this weird interaction with and then to see the guy and then the, the, the shaman freaked out, right? Yeah. Like, oh, my God, like yeah. this guy, like you talk no, to this the guy freaks out that you're in trouble. Yeah. When the shaman He's freaks out, like, you know, you've, you've yeah. broken through because the shaman yeah. kept telling me like, "Ooh, you're a big one. Something's going on here. I don't know what's happening. Like, you know, told me like uh, basically told me I'm a, uh, like a messenger, like you're yeah. like the, the, your connect things are connecting through and you've got some things to do. Yeah. And I yep. think you are that. I think that's one of the things that, you know, makes you so funny and makes you so connectable to people is that. And then there's the show you did, The Messenger. You know, tell us a bit about that. Well, I did a one man show on, uh, on this experience re- reluctantly. Put it this okay. way. I did not I did not want to do this show, Dr. Mm-hmm. Ross. I, I, there was no way I wanted to go out and be this vulnerable in front of people. Right. Yeah. And talk about what. My experience was like I had done stand up. That's one thing, but this was not going to be hiding behind jokes. Of course, some of it's going to come out funny because you're a funny guy and you're going right. to tell your experience. But I was like, 
terrified to do this show to the point where a couple of days before the show, I went to see another person's one man show. I'd also never done a one man show, by the way. Mm, okay. Right? I'd done stand up. So I went to see this guy's show, and there was like, I don't know, 18 people there. And at the end of the show, they were like, and I was like, oh my God, I'm going to go out and bear and tell all this weird shit to people. And then I'm going to get this. Class. So I, I went home and immediately threw up all day, uh, meditated, had my meditation skills okay. put in it. I was at the point where I didn't want to do it so badly. I was going to call in and say like, my mother has cancer or right. something. Like I was going yeah. full Larry David oh, yeah. and I was going to get out of this. And even when I was standing backstage and the music was playing for the show to start, yeah. there was a fire exit beside me. And I was like, go out that door. You are not going on that stage. And then the music stopped and my feet were walking. I'm like, Oh God, here we go. And yeah. that's the most scared I've ever been since maybe the first time I did stand up. Okay. Like I hadn't been scared uh, on stage in a long time. And the reason one of the things, the reason it was called the messenger was I got given six. It turned out um, things to tell people. I was given these messages, go say this to this person. Mm -hmm. And, um, I didn't know what any of them meant. So the first thing was a friend of mine, Dave Nystrom, who kept, who's had a lot of kids, mm -hmm. he's kept having kids and he was like about to have his fourth kid. And one of the things I was told was, Hey, uh, it's not your wife that wants to keep having kids. It's you, you've got this okay. cycle going. If you want to end this cycle, you're supposed to name this last kid dave jr that'll break the cycle okay. if you want to do this then you're supposed to name. so we come back this is in la we have a stopover in la afterwards this is something i've told kenny and the shaman i'm like this is kind of crazy and whatever and i wasn't going to say anything yeah. and kenny was there with dave he's like well are you, why don't you tell dave and natasha what happened with you and i'm like kenny i don't want to <laughs> you know and so i told them i said well look i got told this thing blah blah, blah that you're supposed to name dave jr. and then dave went white Natasha stopped. He's like, uh, I've been driving around for the last five days. And all I've been thinking is like, I think we're, I should name this kid Dave Jr. Right. So he had already had this. His wife overruled him, said, yep. we're going to name the kid Stone. Shut your mouth. Okay. <laughs> Whatever. Yep. But um, that was the first thing. And I would come back and and I had to like go to see this guy. And I'm like, I was supposed to tell you, like, help me, help you, help me. I don't know what that means. We have this whole thing. We don't know. I tell him about the ayahuasca. He turned out that he had wrote a dissertation or something on, uh, the, oh, man, I'm not going to remember the name of the book right now, which is important to this story. But it was a, an early book on like hallucinogenics and a guy that d went into the desert in, say, the 19, early 60s. Oh, I, I know the name of them. Yeah. Okay. Castaneda. Uh, ca uh, and Castaneda. Something, something yeah. the Castaneda, yeah. the, 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 this book. And he told me, go get this book. This is the first okay. thing I wrote. Get this book. So that's what he told me. Help me, help me. Can't find it anywhere. I look around for ages, try to order it. Then I have to go have a chat with my mom who's, you know, she's given me a copy of The Secret every year for 12 years. I was saying, I wait until I get a dozen, then I'm going to get a bunch of people in a circle, do a chant, and punch a hole through the universe, right? Like my mother was all about this, crystals, all this stuff. So I had to tell her like, look, turns out it's not you that's supposed to be doing this stuff. It's me. Mm. Like You're the teacher. I'm the one who's supposed to learn this. I'm the one who's supposed to. So my mom was crying. Because now she was like, oh, it turns out her life, like she figured out her life purpose and all. And then I told her about this, that I'm looking for this book. And she's like, go to the shelf. And the book this guy told me to get is the first book my mom got that sent her down this path. Right. So then I read the book. And then in the book are images that they talk about and drawings of things I saw. But this book is written 40 years before I go and right. do it. So now I'm seeing images of things I saw. So it gets more confusing. And the last thing. There's a few other people I have to tell right. and stories along the way. But the very last thing I had to do was tell people, like, do this show. You have to tell these. Right. It was the sixth and final thing, right? So the last piece was come out and tell them. So I told, and, you know, people wrote to me, this show changed my life. And, yeah. and a bunch of them wanted to do ayahuasca. Hey, how do I do this? Whatever. And I put them in touch. And basically none of them went. Right, like a lot of people want to do it or whatever, but it's it's two people that I know out of all the people that wanted information about it actually went. Yeah, and so 
you know, it doesn't really fit into the medical field, but I, 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 I will say that people. Well, it kind of does in a way in that, you know, we have to start seeing in medicine that there's a sort of a spiritual component that we don't understand. I think in medicine, we've, we've been driven down this very left brain analytical, here's your drug, here's this, here's, and there's nothing wrong with that in a lot of ways, but it makes us lose that you know, human connection. There's, there's doctors that I call technicians, which are brilliant, yeah. brilliant doctors, but they have no bedside manner. They have no interaction with people. Ran right? into one of those. Yeah. So, oh yeah. Well, you're yeah. To, yeah. You're going to, for sure. So, yeah. so, and, and it, it attracts people like, like the, you know, the intense intellectual commitment to being a specialist attracts some people that are very intellectual, very left brain, but they don't have a whole lot of right brained ability to be connected with other people, which is too bad. So I call those those doctors technicians because they're brilliant at what they do, but they don't have that ability to kind of reassure people, which is, you know, a lot about being a doctor is like reassurance. You know, even though, you know, in the back of your mind, this could be really bad, you still reassure people and say, yeah. you know, like they did with you. It's like, okay, there's, you know, there's a chance that this, this is, you're going to be fine, you know, but I think that's one of the things that we lose in medicine is we start getting into this place where we get so analytic and we're supposed to be these dispassionate observers. And especially when you look at psychiatry, as you look at, you know, we're supposed to look at these people who are really suffering with schizophrenia or bipolar or anxiety. And we're supposed to be these dispassionate scientific observers of, you know, what they're showing to us when really what they need is a connection to other people. The reason why they showed up with these illnesses in the first place is because they didn't have a connection to their parents typically. Yeah. So, you know, not that you have to be a surrogate parent, but you have to have some sort of humanity. And I think we're kind of losing that. And I think if, if, I think if a lot of doctors did like ayahuasca or even microdosing, I think it would really show them what it's like to be on the other side. I think uh, microdosing is a good way for anybody to step into it, I feel, mm -hmm. because I, I've tried that as well when I got back. And then you can buy them. There's oddly enough there's like a mushroom store now called zoomers you can just go in okay. and it's got it in like because they're decriminalized in vancouver so right. they got it in like here's the microdose size here's what a normal size is here's if you want to go you know hang out yeah. with dragons right you don't have to just get the microdose don't go the and it, it's 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 a it's a small enough amount at least for me that i could um i could take it uh and i could still go look uh at condos to buy right like like one of the you know like i could still go you're functional you do stuff but everything's a little greener mm -hmm. if you walk along the seawall right. and you see a person looking out to the ocean you think wow what are they thinking Think about right it. like you just it, you, it, it connects you up a little but it's not going to yeah. send you off you're not going to be overwhelmed mm -hmm. uh, this is my experience at least you know if, if you're thinking if you're a person who's maybe never done any of this sort of stuff and you're like oh you know like just yeah. start with a a little microdose because I've, you know, one of the things I think I told you about the ayahuasca was I came back with a very positive feeling about the universe, mm -hmm. mankind, humanity, right. felt a lot of love, thought things were great. Like I saw, uh, Hey, we're all connected. The earth's a lot. Like, whereas my friend who went with us, Kenny yeah. had an opposite effect where he came back. I mean, he had some brilliant breakthroughs, didn't he? but yeah. he came back and all he saw was all the assholes that did awful stuff on the side. Like mm -hmm. he felt like he was, you know, he said he felt a little bit like he was in a cage with right. a bunch of animals. Like he, it, he, he now noticed everybody who wasn't doing, like he was probably shown yeah. the nice stuff, but he only saw who was not doing this. Right. And that's probably not great. Right. Like I, well, I don't think to come back and that's yeah. your new reality. And it started immediately for him in the airport. Yeah. Right. Well, like it wasn't Kenny, a gradual. Knowing Kenny the way that I do and the way that we do. You used to, you had a great nickname for Kennedy. You used to, uh, Kenny used to call him the professional friend. Yes. He because is a professional he friend. So good at helping people. Right. Like it's, it's almost a compulsion for him to help people. So yeah. when he sees people that don't help others, it's really going to, you know, rankle him for sure. So I can actually see him doing it that way because he is so good at helping other people like he's, on your movie he was like he was you know, i, I think he worked harder than anybody else that guy was running around at no point does he ever stop he was sweating and like professional for like i you know i come back and my car had, had stopped in Kamloops, which is three four hours away from here or whatever my car died i had to go back to get or whatever and i said oh i gotta get the car he's like well let's go i'll drive you and he just 
And this is at like, I don't know, 2 p.m. on a Monday. He'll just drive you to wherever, drop what he's doing. Like, I don't know many people that will help. You know, that's why we call him professional friend. And he's not looking for anything in return. No. He's not like, hey, you owe me one. I'm doing this as a favor. He he actually does not like it if you, yes. So, yes. So, a very, and you know, and thank God I had him with me on this trip because on the flight down, when they hand out the cards, you got to fill in the, I was like, where are we going? I didn't even bother to name, know the name of the town, airport. I, uh, it was in the email. Kenny had it. I realized, like, I don't even know where I'm going okay, on this thing, man. Yeah. 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 So, for sure. um, so I just wanted to let, you know, people know that, hey, some of you, it, it's not, it's not an across the board um, yeah, exactly. cure. It's not some, it's not some miracle cure. It, I, for some of us, it's, it's, does a lot and mm-hmm. it's great and, and and i guess for others like you you know your experience was not much some people have probably well, it was pretty my experience was just you know total terrifying fear so but that taught me something too i didn't get when i came out of it i didn't get some sort of revelation like i'm a part of everything and all that kind of stuff although i did get a little bit of that it was mostly just overwhelmed with this fear but there was this kind of sense that there, I think the thing that I got from ayahuasca was there's something greater than us. There's something greater than us. And I think when you get traumatized as a child, like growing up with a dad with severe schizophrenia and, and bipolar, you lose faith in the world. You lose faith that the world is a safe place. And then when you see it, that it actually is a safe place, or there is a place that's, that's beyond your perceptions of what this horrible you know, thing could be. Just opening the door to something different was something that was kind of revelational to me. And in a way, it kind of started my process to write the book and that kind of stuff. Yeah. But I would not say that the, you know ayahuasca was a, in any way a, a pleasurable experience for me at all. You know, it was just pain well, mostly all the way through. You know what? For a number of people, it's not a pleasurable yeah, experience. And sure. it's just facing pain. But what you brought up there is the uh, there's something greater than yourself. So what you come out of it with is... There's an undeniable, all the stuff we don't know, you still don't get to know. Right. But you do, you, it does confirm that it exists. Whatever that is, you can't really explain it. You don't really know what's going to happen. Like, I don't know how all this works or anything. Right. But you realize that there's a whole bunch of stuff going on that we can't, you know, like, like you know, it, this is a ridiculous example, but there could be a, a giant head looking at us, but we can't. Yeah. see it because like an ant wouldn't see it or whatever like uh the what is it called the the ships the the first ships that came to oh i told you the story yeah that you couldn't see you can't yeah. see the ships beyond so, like that yeah there is a story that when the the tall ships came from yeah. the america the you know to from europe to america the natives couldn't perceive the ships they would yeah. they would describe like the water looked different the water looked you know, like choppy or different because it was so outside of whatever they had seen before that they couldn't yeah. actually perceive it. They didn't have a story yeah. for it. They didn't have a yeah. concept they, about it. And I think that's true with, with, you know, what you, with in ayahuasca and, and to some extent, these other psychedelics, they allow you to see that there's a different possibility to what you've convinced yourself is the limitation of your own perception. Yeah. I'd say that that's, that's a good, a good way to sum it up is that stuff that you couldn't see is now, you know, because you, until they had seen those ships that that didn't exist in their yeah. universe. Yeah. So they yeah. couldn't identify it. Right. And, um, and even what you said there about like, Oh, it was a lot of pain, but it sort of put me on the road to start writing this book. Exactly. Like it opens up a little, it changes maybe, Hey, I'm going to go and do that. Like it, it nowhere in the program. Does it tell you you're going to have a great time for sure on ayahuasca? It just says, you know, and the, and the first thing oh, I read, yeah. like it was a National Geographic article mm-hmm. and it looked, I was scared reading it. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. well, it's a roller coaster ride, but I'm willing to, I've gone to the dark side on other stuff. It's not pleasurable, but I thought the exchange, I was, I was willing to risk or, and I really wish I didn't have to go through that part, mm-hmm. you know, and if anybody's in there, like. Hey, don't worry. I can handle my, my drugs. So like, I thought I could like, eh, it's going to get you, man. Like you're going to have, yeah. you're going to have some, you're going to probably yeah. have one of the most fearful, terrifying experiences in your life. Yep. And if you're lucky left like myself, you're, I got to have 
the uh i got to go have a you know hop in god's hot tub for a while and hang yeah. out have a have a few laughs with them whereas you just got uh scared and left out on the lawn it just point <laughs> it just, but it just pointed me in a different direction and i think too what it showed when when i was about the first two or three days after ayahuasca i felt like a ghost like i just felt hollow i didn't i didn't even really feel like i was alive i just felt like a complete ghost and but the farther I got from it, one month, six months, a year later, it's like, okay, well, you you did that the first night. It was by far and away the scariest thing I have ever experienced by a million, you know? And then yet I still went back the second night. So it was like, yeah. it just showed me, I think it, out of the whole lesson of that, it's like, I'm incredibly strong, even though my anxiety tells me I'm not. Yeah. So, but to go back and do that again after the first night, it's like, I can, if I can do that, I can freaking do anything the, you know what that's a really good it's a really good point and maybe that's also why they make it more than one time oh yeah people because after the first night because my first night started out fantastic and went a little sour oh, on the back oh. nine I had, I had a tough back nine i like to say <laughs> i had a tough back nine um so i was not excited to go into night two and i know some people have just stopped at that but i was like mm -hmm. and what my worries were was that i knew I hadn't got it all out. I knew there was a bunch left in there. And so I knew you're going to have to go. There's, you're going to, you're going to have to finish facing that. Right. And I don't know, maybe a bit of that is afterwards. Maybe that's the liberation afterwards of facing those fears. I mean, they're like, now that you faced them, uh, yeah, I was never, I didn't think I was a very scared guy of things. Like I've always right. been a guy like, who's not afraid to fail and try stuff. Right. But I'm also maybe a guy that um, had a lot of fear of succeeding. Yeah. I like think in a way. On some level, you know, yeah. I, think that's a, I think that's a universal thing for, for people. And I think we, we get this idea that people are, you know, succeeding and that, that they, they were meant to do this. And I'm sure there are a few sort of Taylor Swift people out there in the world. But in general, I think that whenever we level up to something new, there is, there is a, 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 a dysphoria with that for sure but before we go i want to just okay. attack. so when you when the lights went on and your your legs walked you out there how did you get over that anxiety because that would have been anxiety of the of the whole one man show it. yeah of doing it not running when my, when my feet door. started going out and i had to go do the show um oddly enough i decided to open the show maybe this was maybe this is how it all comes together I decided to open the show by doing and saying the prayer that I start with every morning. Mm. And I, it's different now than what I did then, but right. it was like, uh, hey, uh, put the people on my path that I may need to meet and let me see the signs to guide me on this journey. I know that was part of one of the first things I said, and that actually did help me. Like I, By saying that just in life every morning, when someone talked to me i listened more like was this important and i and and i noticed these things and and i did about a year where i was guy i went by intuition for mm -hmm. the most part and it was a spectacular year which was hard because you you're not trained to do that but maybe that calmed me down but i still remember being like shaky when i picked up what i wanted to read about it and it just i think luckily from being on stage and in front of people for years of doing stand up. Sure. If I had never done that, I probably would have just thrown up in front of everyone and walked back off the stage. <laughs> but it left me a, enough time that um, I got going into it. But I never, I got to tell you that first night of the show, because I didn't even run it. Right. I didn't do a rehearsal. I didn't okay. have, I, I had it on a wall of like, I think this is what's going to come out. It's 75 mm -hmm. minutes. I got an idea about what I want to talk about. I knew my points where I wanted to get to. Didn't know how long it was going to be, how I was going to get to all these points. I, I wanted to just tell, I, and what I kept thinking of before I went out was, Hey, just tell the story. It told you to tell the story. It's going to come out funny. You're a funny guy. Just do the story. And and it worked, but that anxiety of the beginning, and I don't think it ever dissipated during that first show okay. or any uh, of them. I was all, I was pretty nervous, but in the end, it was probably the most rewarding thing I'd ever done. Oh. Right. Cause it's silence. Like I, like 
I, by the end, I was enjoying when it was completely silent and people were crying and emotional. I was enjoying that more than people laughing, which was my, not my default going in. And, and somebody, I forget what the quote is, uh, whatever things that are, uh, lie on the other side of fear, like whatever, yeah, whatever like, want, like yeah. the thing you want I, the most is on the other side of fear is right? on the other side of fear. So whenever I have fear, I just like, look, I, if, being brave doesn't mean you're not afraid. No. It just means you face, you know, we're all afraid when we do yeah. these things. And you think like, oh, look at that guy can do it anytime. Like you're internally, you're like, I don't know if I can do this, but I'm going to do it. And then it works. Out. And then when it's through, you're like, oh, wow. You understand, you get the reward. So that was, that's what came out of that. And I, and I didn't, you know, I didn't have drinks before. I didn't have anything to calm right. my anxiety. I wasn't on any type of pills. I didn't have any of that sort of stuff in my system. And I, you know, I hope nobody else has to go through that type of anxiety. But I guess people listening to this podcast, maybe, oh, yeah. uh, you know what? I'm, I, if anybody's like that and you wake up and feel that way all day, like it must be horrific. I don't, you know, terrible. like, it is yeah, I, yeah, I've never had that kind of, yeah. but it will, I will also say that before the ayahuasca and that, and the drink is stop drinking. When my eyes opened every morning, uh, it, it was already going. Like the panic of what I had to do with my sure. life. And it reminded me, you know in a movie when uh, the stock market's going down and there's paper flying everywhere, everyone's angry. Oh, my God, That's how my brain was when I woke up every morning. There was a stock market crash. And now I kind of wake up and uh, upon awakening, I move out to the couch, meditate, pray, start my day. And there's a balance. So now I wake up calm. I don't look at anything for the first hour or two. Good advice. And and do that to start my day, and then, and then I pick up my phone and freak out, right? With whatever's yeah, sure. come my way or whatever. But I, but I, I can deal with a little, right? I can, uh, it's not taking me in the wrong direction every day. Yeah, you grounded yourself, and I think that's really important. And I think a lot of people with anxiety are so quote unquote comfortable with the anxiety. It's so familiar for them that initially they will distract. They will go to their phone initially. They will try and distract themselves away. And basically a lot of healing from anxiety is feeling that discomfort, that alarm sensation in your body, and just allowing that sensation to be there. And in fact, focusing on it, concentrating on it, allowing it to be there, as opposed to immediately going up into your thoughts and trying to think your way out of a feeling. Because as soon as you go up into your thoughts, you bypass this alarm in your body. And the alarm is the, is the root cause of what's causing the anxiety in the first place. And if every time you feel that anxiety, that alarm in your body, you go into your head, your body never gets dealt with. It never gets metabolized. And I think these, yeah. these chemicals basically yeah. force you to look Dude. at them and they give you this sense of faith that there is something beyond you because a lot of us have parents that weren't there for us when we were yeah. little and it's like we lose faith in the world and when you lose faith in the world you start thinking as a child everything is up to me and if you're seven years old and you think everything's up to me it's going to be a very very difficult place and you're going to go back to that place when you feel really really anxious and afraid so it's learning that there's faith there's something beyond you is another thing that that's what ayahuasca did for me it's like oh, there's something out outside of my little perception of fear that's actually even greater than me. And I can kind of go into that and have faith in that and just allow that faith to sit there because that's a much better place to be in. That it's much better to, to be in that sense of discomfort, that alarm in my body, but still have faith at the same time. And then I metabolize that alarm. Otherwise, you just go into I, your head and you just drive yourself crazy. I don't know if we're any, but that what you said on Close. faith that it gets out of yeah. you, I, I will say that that is probably a huge thing because what you just said about seven and thinking you have to do everything on your own, that's the way I kind of grew up. Like yeah. I, I felt like it was all on my own. So I didn't have a lot of faith in anything. And, yeah. and I think faith is maybe the key to all of it. And faith doesn't mean you have to be religious or all that. All yeah. faith, I, faith just means that I guess the best way to describe it is you're putting, you're stepping forward into something without a, a definitive, a definitive yeah. outcome that is guaranteed to you, but you step into it like moving in that direction. And if you step in with faith, it usually works out in that direction Yeah, is what I, is what I've found. And, and something I've said to people. I don't know if I ever said this to you, but a lot of people often say when things go good or bad, when they go good, they say like, look what I did. 
And when things are awful, they say like, look what happened to me. Mm -hmm. Right. But you could also say like, it could be the, it could be the opposite. Like you could, if you just, when things are, you know, not going your way or whatever, instead of panicking, like the, I don't know what the universe is conspiring to send my way. Like, I don't know if right now there's some person who has a big plan and they're talking about being like, it's coming my way, but it's not here yet. Like you can, you can let you could be like, look what happened to me could be a good thing as well. You don't have to take credit for everything. And you can also cause damage and be like, look what oh, I did. Yeah. We don't, we don't often go back and say like, I crushed that person's life. Yep. And here's so, a goofy, trivial little story here is that basically the publishers sent me 25 of my hardcover books and I was waiting for these books. And it's like, oh my God, I, I, I want to do the opening. You know, I see on Instagram authors getting their books up. And th- instead of putting my address, they drop the first number. So yeah, books getting to get delivered. So I'm like getting pretty pissed off that I want these books. And it's like, okay, I'm going to get these books, you know, whatever. And then, so the publisher sent me another 25 books. So basically on the same day, I got 50 books (laughs) books. instead of 25. So it's like, it's just like, why did I get so upset about the first 25? Because something better was actually coming along. And that sounds, it may seem like a trivial example, but it's just an, an understanding that things will happen the way they're supposed to. And if you perceive it's going to be negative, it will be negative to you. But if you yes. stay open in faith that something else could happen in its place and, uh, you know, akin to that prayer that you say, like, bring the people close to me. And, like, and I'd probably like to end on that. You know, it's just like um, if you've got any final words and just sort of end on that prayer yeah. that you said to the, the messenger, I think that's the best way to wrap um, it all up. Yeah, it's uh, put the people on my path that I may need to meet. And let me see the signs to guide me on this journey. Um, Let me hear your message and act on the intuition you provide. Sounds good to me, man. That's my mantra every day. Thanks for being here. Use it or lose it. (laughs) And Kenny, hand Hand me those pants. pants.